Okay, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about Michel Foucault, uh, deeply important, and a very influential philosopher of the 20th century. Now, um, within our course, I suppose the immediate starting point for talking about Foucault is that he provides something of a synthesis between the um, legacy of Friedrich Nietzsche and the legacy of Karl Marx. Um, I suppose, again, last time um, when, we talk, when we spoke of Nietzsche, um, I said that we have reached a certain kind of culmination in the course, right? Uh, uh, this notion that actually the problem of political philosophy has, um, you know, a certain tentative uh, uh, solution, which lies in the common interest. Now, I said that in theory, it's a simple solution, yet putting this solution into practice may be indeed a very difficult task, knowing what the common interest is or how to achieve it, right, is not simple at all. And the best person, maybe, perhaps, to examine uh, the problems associated with this project is actually Michel Foucault. So there's a um, deep sense of pessimism and there's a uh, deep um, critical insight in Foucault, right, which he deploys precisely in questioning this assumption of the project of the Enlightenment. Remember, we have spoken how uh, uh, the notion of the Enlightenment is that individuals are rational, we have a common human nature, we have a common human interest, and so it is possible through a science of society to create laws which are rational, such that rational individuals would freely choose to obey the rational laws. And so, um, and in, in, in John Stuart Mill, in uh, um, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, but also, very importantly, in Karl Marx, right? We have seen, so Marx plus Hegel and plus Mill, uh, uh, we have seen this um, notion of society of consensus. Again, I remind you how Marx talks about how in communism proper, there will be no difference between altruism and egoism. Human nature is pro-social. We become properly human and properly happy only in a well-ordered society. And in a well-ordered society, again, engaging with our fellow human beings in a productive fashion is what enables us, and at the same time, something that advance, advances societies, the, the society as a whole, right? Uh, and which Marx imagines as the cosmopolitan society of all humanity around the globe. And again, Marx has this wonderful phrase, the free development of each as the condition for the free development of all. And I have spoken uh, last time extensively, we have discussed how Nietzsche, I think, it's a controversial assertion on my part, but I feel that Nietzsche subscribes to this ideal of development, ideal of uh, the, ex the free expression of human creativity, you know, free development, flourishing of the human individuality as the end goal, as the end game of history. And again, this is something which tentatively Marx, Hegel, Mill, and Nietzsche can agree on. Now, in Nietzsche, there's some question about the is odd problem. Remember, uh, uh, Zarathustra, imagining that uh, Nietzsche speaks through the mouth of Zarathustra. Zarathustra says, what matters my happiness? It is poverty and filth and wretched contentment. My happiness in and of itself is not valuable at all. It's worthless. However, it is my happiness that ought to justify existence itself. Dasein selbst rechtfertigen, right? And, um, but once we, you know, through this act of will, through this voluntaristic, you know, pragmatic, performative solution to the is or problem, once we agree that the human individual flourishing is the end game, then we can ask, you know, how can we flourish together? And I think it's very clear, starting from Plato and Aristotle, especially in Aristotle, again, this notion of zoon politikon, that human beings are properly happy, properly human, only in well-ordered societies. That yes, societies sometimes restrict us, but so much more societies enable us, right? And again, me being able to give this lecture to you is such a wonderfully cooperative enterprise. Can this shirt that I'm wearing was made by somebody? You know, the, 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 the microphone, the board, 
right? The whole production process, right? So many people have to work together. You can think of Adam Smith's notion of invisible hand. And Nietzsche himself, with all of his criticism of uh, the bourgeois society, with all of his criticism of the slave morality, right? Uh, uh, with all of that, I mean, Nietzsche himself had teachers, he had books, he had food to eat, right? So Nietzsche was able to flourish and to write. And you can see, again, like, this is a result of Nietzsche's own genius, but his genius uniquely was enabled by the social structure in which he found himself. And, you know, the, the development, the, the um, expression of his individual free creativity would have been impossible without teachers, without students, without publishers, without readers, right? So we're all we're in this together. Again, so, uh, uh, in Marx, remember, had this phrase that he takes from Feuerbach, Gattungswesen, that human nature, human nature is a species nature. We are species beings. Our uh, uh, essence is unique, uniquely realized in society, not to mention again to um, something goes back to Rousseau, again, this notion of perfectibility, that human beings without society, we are unfinished. Again, human individuals abandoned, you know, children abandoned in the woods do not grow up to be. Uh, well-rounded human individuals. Society needs to fill in the blanks, so to speak. We are unfinished, we are underdetermined by instinct, right? And so, um, in general, um, there's this dichotomy that we have been talking about and we keep re returning to over and over and over again, the conflict side, the consensus side. Again, very much the, the, the task of politics, and this can be most clearly, I think, seen in Marx. In Marx, there's the, we can see the promise of enlightenment, the promise of political philosophy, right? That it is possible in principle to create a you know, harmonious society in which uh, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, right? This is, I insist, the most important definition of communism for Marx. But at the same time, very obviously, so many people do not find themselves in well-ordered societies. So many people find themselves in situations which are uh, abusive, you know, violent, oppressive, where society takes advantage of individuals. And again, it's like uh, uh, the immediate example that we keep talking about is, let's say, ancient slavery or let's say medieval feudalism. It's uh, uh, quite obvious to most people, at least most students I talk to, that the feudal arrangement is an abusive arrangement. It's a conflictual arrangement, which may be sustained by ideological lies, deception and misinterpretation, uh, you know, a kind of symbolic violence, but still there is this uh, 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 there is this, um, there is this level. And so in this binary opposition between conflict and consensus, and again, I remind you that preliminarily, um, I suggest that we look at these terms as ideal types. Probably most societies find themselves somewhere in the middle between being perfectly conflictual or perfectly consensual, right? Somewhere in the middle. To some extent, societies are conflictual and take advantage of their members or of particular individuals. Uh, and to some extent, societies are consensual and indeed enable us. And kind of the truth is somewhere in the middle, like a combination of the two ideal types. But in this dichotomy, in this binary opposition, we see at the same time the promise of political philosophy, but also the challenge of political philosophy, the critical aspect of political philosophy, and then the hopefully progressive and the reformist aspect of political philosophy, but also to some extent maybe the conservative aspect of political philosophy, because to the extent that we already live in consensual societies, maybe we should uh, strive to conserve what is already consensual. And, you know, so as, as Cicero says, right, uh, uh, the best is the enemy of the good, or the better is the enemy of the good. Now, having said all that, having said all that, let's switch gears a little bit and let me try to introduce again the deep critical insight that Foucault brings to bear. Now, in an, in an important sense, elements of this critical insight are already present in Nietzsche and in Marx before Foucault, but uh, uh, Foucault makes them much more explicit. So, as we have been talking over and over and over again in the his intellectual history of humanity, it's a strong and controversial assertion on my part, possibly the most important intellectual transformation in all of human intellectual history is this transition from some sort of, uh, uh, um, I want to say, primary or primitive, at least um, temporally primary, teleological understanding of the world, teleological understanding of the world, explanation in terms of goals, purposes, intentions, right? Intentionalistic explanations. Mm -hmm. Go back to the ancient Greeks. Why do the seasons change? Because Demeter, the goddess of the earth, 
you know, is in a good mood. That's why there's spring, right? So there's an intention, and <clears throat> the result of the intention is um, change in the physical world. So explain nature by appealing to purposes, maybe God's purposes, or why is there an eclipse? Because gods are angry and they have blotted out the sun. The mechanistic explanation is a quantum leap of human imagination. It's an explanation which uh, appeals to abstract, impersonal, changeless regularities, patterns, right? Uh, which are, again, objective and abstract. And in some sense, again, in the Western tradition, this explanation maybe goes back to Thales. Maybe. Um, so the notion is that this is a very important transformation when we talk about the natural world, so repudiation of Aristotelian teleological worldview, and the establishment with people such as Galileo and Newton, but also Thomas Hobbes and Francis Bacon, of the new mechanistic worldview. Right? This also an important uh, um, point on this road is, of course, the decline of religious sentiment. And uh, we, we've had an occasion to mention uh, uh, with Nietzsche last time the notion of the death of God. Even people who are, who consider themselves religious today, most of these people do not live by the holy book. They maybe nominally call themselves Christians or Muslims or Buddhists, but by and large, uh, the choices that they make are guided by something else and not necessarily their religious convictions. M more often than not, the choices are guided by the coercive laws of market competition. Again, I, I talk to my students, right, and even among those of my students who consider themselves to be deeply religious, right, the reason they chose this particular program, let's say, to enroll in this particular program has nothing to do with their religion, but has everything to do with the structure of the capitalist system, right? In some sense, it is the log coercive logic of the market that forces their parents to enroll them into these programs, let's say to, you know, uh, um, forces their, their children to become economists, whether they are interested in economics or like economics or whatnot, right? Uh, um, anyway, so talking about this transformation from teleological to the mechanistic, it should also be applied to the human individual, sort of to take the black box of the human individual whom we suppose uh, in a naive fashion to be free and rational and to dis, you know, disentangle the, the, um, the elements, the components that go into the system. Think of the human being as a machine, as a mechanical clock, and something, something that Thomas Hobbes tried to do. Again, life is but a motion of limbs, right? So there is no interesting difference between a mechanical clock and a human being for, for um, uh, Hobbes, right? But the question is, what exactly makes this machine tick. And um, last time we had an occasion, again, to mention that uh, uh, the, the mechanistic account of the human beings, again, appeals to the, well, one way of looking at it is to appeal to two notions of evolution, to Darwin and, and therefore to the uh, 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 biological evolution. Um, Evolutionary psychology, we would say today, things like modular theory of the mind, new, contemporary neuroscience, again, so the astonishing hypothesis that all of our mental life is simply a, a result of electrochemistry of the brain, right? But at the same time, uh, uh, and many names could be named here, I mean, Hegel, among other, other people, but maybe let's write the name of Marx, right? Marx talks about a certain kind of cultural evolution. And in both biological and cultural evolution, we have a kind of a process of natural selection. And what gets selected for are the most efficient genotypes and the most efficient cultural types, right? So we have the, in, in Marx, we have the um, socioeconomic formations, right? The culture, you know, economic slash cultural systems, the, the economic base and the ideological superstructure on top of it. And these socioeconomic systems are in competition with one another. And Marx talks about how in a very quasi-Darwinian fashion, how, for example, the capitalist mode of production drives the feudal mode of production to extinction. So the ultimate upshot of this entire picture, and this is what I want to get to when we talk about Foucault, right? So when we talk about conflict and consensus, right, we say that there's a human nature, that there's a human interest, we have a common interest. But where does the interest come from? Is it the case that somehow communism is this magical society in which the interests of the individual coincide with the interest of the whole? Or is it the case that human beings are products of larger forces, of biological and cultural evolution, manufactured by those forces? You know, human beings manufactured with particular desires, with particular inclinations, with particular beliefs, manufactured in order to fulfill their part 
in the logic of perpetuation of these systems of biological and cultural evolution, right? That uh, 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 ultimately the reason why the interests of the individual and society are coincide is not because there's some magical coincidence and we have right at, at, at utopia, but because, like to use this manufacturing analogy, you know, this <laughs> capitalist or maybe post-capitalist, post-industrial capitalist, late capitalist system produces the kinds of individuals that it needs, manufactures them as if on a factory, right? And this is the deep insight, again, Foucault is more complicated than that, but you know, as a starting point, it's a, it's a good enough approximation, right? So this idea of structure versus, versus agency, when we explain human behavior, we do not appeal to human free choice, but we appeal to the structures, to the structures that give rise, that produce human individuals, right? And this is uh, something that we've already mentioned when we spoke about Nietzsche last time. Again, this notion of anti-humanism, or maybe the death of the subject, that again, human beings are simply, like, first of all, they're complicated. They're, as, as Nietzsche says, there are many different souls fighting for control within one's psyche. Plato talks about the appetitive, the spirited, and the rational part. Freud talks about id, id ego, and superego. There are many different parts. There's human biology fighting against, you know, human cultural upbringing, right? In, in this nexus, which is the individual. Uh, uh, um, but again, but the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate result is that <laughs> uniquely, we, you know, we find individuals as products of these, again, structural forces. And if that's the case, if that's the case, if our interests are manufactured by society, then what meaning <laughs> uh, um, does this notion of common interest have? Doesn't this throw a, a monkey wrench into this entire system, right? And uh, um, so this, this, this is the deep critical insight that Foucault brings to bear, and I suppose if I were to try to summarize it in one sentence, is again, is this notion that for Foucault, the project of liberation, the project of liberation is always suspect, is always suspicious. So we, we, behind any kind of rhetoric of liberation, rhetoric of enlightenment, we suspect simply a more efficient form of determination. And uh, this is, I suppose, this is, I suppose, uh, 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 the, my ultimate summary of, of, of Foucault uh, um, before we begin discussing the details of his philosophy in earnest. Um, that liberation could simply serve as a mask for simply a more efficient form of determination. And to try, we'll, you know, in the remaining of, of this lecture, we'll try to make this notion more precise and try to trace out the implications. And at the end of the day, what, you know, to ask the question, what do we do with this? What does Foucault suggest we do with this? And what, what could we do with this kind of um, understanding? So one immediate way um, to get systematically into Foucault's philosophy is with the notion of disciplinary power and possibly his most important and most widely read book, Discipline and Punish, Surveiller et Punir. Um, so before we begin, I want to, again, make some links to the course at large. So we are talking in Foucault here about a certain kind of anti-humanist project. So when we say anti-humanism, we mean, like an, in a structural fashion, mechanistic as opposed to teleological understanding or explanation of human behavior, right? So, as opposed to what Foucault calls transcendental narcissism, imagining that human beings have free will to simply create themselves, right? We start from the realization that the, the human subject is a contingent product of forces. And these forces, in many ways, are historically conditioned, historically contingent. It is not men who make history, but history who makes men. You know, history makes men. We've seen this again in Rousseau, in Hegel, in Marx. Um, and, and Foucault continues, in, in an important sense, continues this project, again, this structural analysis, structural anti-humanist analysis. Uh, this is often expressed uh, uh, through the notion of the death of subject, death of subject. Um, that, and again, in, in many ways goes back to David Hume's criticism of the self. Do I know myself? Do I control myself? You can even extend this back to the ancient Buddhists, if you like. Uh, Buddha says something very similar. Do, do I know my conscious life? Do I control everything? 
that happens to me, right? It's uh, implicit in there the notion of the unconscious, that there are things that human beings cannot control. And in an immediate sense, right, you can see this vanishing point of the eye, vanishing point of the eye, beset on two sides by external, if you want, coercive mechanisms, the biological mechanisms, again, this slavery to passion, or the cultural mechanisms, broadly speaking, ide ideology, you know, ideological um, mis misrepresentation of reality, ideological indoctrination, domination, right? Notice this is a deeply conflictual view. Again, I'm always, when I talk about this, reminded of Heraclitus. So Polemos pater pandon, war is the father and the king of all. Everything is at war with itself. And the individual is not uh, um, a single self-sufficient unit, but there's war going within the individual soul. And in this sense, again, this is always kind of uh, complicated because Foucault writes more as, a, as an impartial analyst, right? So he's not trying to preach. Uh, to preach certain morality, but I think it's it's important to recognize implicitly, right, that um, what what Foucault is engaged in, he's engaged in a project of struggle, right. So as, as I mentioned, uh, one of Foucault's students, uh, or let's say intellectual heirs, Pierre Bourdieu, calls sociology a, a martial art. Sociology is a martial art. So in this sense, again, philosophy, broadly speaking, is the art of self-defense <laughs> against the potentially coercive logic against slavery to passions or against ideology. And continuation of Nietzschean critical project or Marxist crit critical project, with the, with the exception that, again, I remind you that Foucault is always very uh, suspicious of any kind of, you know, grand, grandiose claims of liberation. So, you know, what I do in this course, talk about this uh, con consensual project of enlightenment, liberation, common interest, you know, Foucault would always be very suspicious. Is this, is this really a project of liberation? Or is this just an efficient, effective rhetoric, which masks different forms of determination, right? So, again, to make this more concrete, Foucault has this phrase, mode of subjectification, mode of subjectification, that again, human beings, let's say children abandoned in the forest, do not grow up to be fully fledged humans, right? Human beings need society to fill in the blanks. We are perfectible, as Rousseau says, we are unfinished, right? So mode of subjectification is mode of being a subject. A human individual is a product of history. Human beings are not individuals by nature. It is culture, and you know, to a very large extent, it's like a post-Renaissance, post-Reformation, maybe post-Industrial Revolution culture, bourgeois capitalist culture that gives rise to a certain kind of understanding of what it, what it means to be an individual. Like Cartesian ego, Descartes, subject Descartes, cogito ergo sum, is not an, an ahistorical universal, but is a particular, you know, uh, particular um, historical archetype that, em that emerges throughout history. And then, you know, in many ways, for Foucault, this is one of the key critical tasks uh, 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 of history, and um, this is what Foucault very explicitly takes from Nietzsche. Again, this question of genealogy that we mentioned last time. Genealogy, as opposed to history, genealogy seeks to uncover the dirty secrets, the, 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 the indecencies which are hiding behind the official accounts of history, right? Gene and genealogy also, very importantly, seeks, so it subverts the official account of history, but also it seeks to find what is contingent. You know, certain things appear necessary and universal, but actually are contingent. And, and genealogy seeks that, right? To, to unmask the contingencies which are masquerading as necessary universals, and also to allow us to uh, uh, contemplate other modes of existence. When we realize that being an individual is a product of a particular historical period, we can imagine different ways of being individuals. And this is something that Foucault, uh, uh, in his own personal project, valued very much, and we'll have an occasion to talk about that. Uh, right, so, so uh, unmask the contingencies. You know, what, what is contingent, unnecessary, right? But our present mode of subjectification uh, in, and in, in this case, in this sense, I want to see, I want to say that there's a very important Marxist influence in Michel Foucault. Now, Foucault should not be called Marxist in a straightforward sense, but clearly his analysis owes a lot to Marx and um, uh, to Nietzsche, but also to Marx, right? And in many ways, Foucault traces the birth of our modern subjectivity to the French Revolution and to the Industrial Revolution, possibly the Industrial Revolution being more important. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the French Revolution. This has been in our background for quite some time. Now, 
Let us talk in, in detail. What do these two revolutions mean? The French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. Well, let's start with the Industrial Revolution. Marx, in writing Das Kapital, unfortunately unfinished, right, talks about the primitive accumulation of capital. Primitive accumulation of capital. Notice, this is a violent process. So, uh, uh, in Britain, associated with this enclosure phenomena, where basically rich landlords, through acts of parliament, expropriate the common lands, enclose the commons, and expel peasants from the land. Basically, you know, theft, uh, uh, usurpation, which is legalized through acts of parliament. So again, again, genealogical dirty secret of modernity. Capitalism begins through this large, you know, theft on a very large scale. So Marx talks about the primitive accumulation of capital, and in many ways, Foucault quite explicitly talks about this, how Discipline and Punish, his book Discipline and Punish, can be seen as a companion to Marx's Das Kapital. And Foucault talks about the primitive accumulation of what Marx would call labor power. So, you, you know, these peasants who are expelled from the land, and Marx has some notion of that, but he doesn't write a detailed history of all this process. But Foucault talks about how these peasants expelled from the land, this rowdy, rowdy bunch of peasants, roam the countryside, make trouble, they engage in peasant rebellions, there's a huge number of troops, deployed at home to fighting against them. This is something that you very often might not see covered very in, in, in great detail in history textbooks, because again, it's a dirty secret of modernity. People don't like to talk about this, right? Uh, but these, these, these peasants, you know, they, they make trouble. They um, engage in violent uprisings. They engage in crime. They spread disease. And so the ruling class wants to bring them under control, right? So primitive accumulation of labor power um, refers to the process by which we take these unruly, unwieldy peasants and we force them, we, we, we break their, you know, rebellious wills, and we force them to become what Foucault calls docile bodies. Docile bodies. Bodies that will stand in the factory, in the shop floor, and perform mundane, menial tasks, repetitive sta tasks over, you know, on the conveyor belt, for example, over and over and over again, and not complain. And do this, you know, at low wages and, you know, uh, be, be, be productive and not make trouble and be obedient, be obedient, right? And perform operations so, uh, in, a, in a strict fashion in which the operations are prescribed, right? And uh, um, how does this happen? Well, Foucault actually refers to a great British utilitarian progressive liberal reformer, Jeremy Bentham, who talks about this idea of the panopticon. So in Bentham, panopticon is a design of a prison. But of course, it's so much more than just the design of a prison. And uh, 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 basically, uh, I'm not sure if I can draw this, but you can imagine um, that um, you have cells, and um, these cells surround a central tower. And in this tower, Bentham says, through the um, system of light and shadow, today we would say through a one-way mirror or maybe through a surveillance cam. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the, the guard is observing the prisoners, but the guard, him, herself, the guard itself, is not observed. So what the, what the inmates, what the prisoners see is they see shadow, they see darkness. And from this darkness, they feel a gaze upon them, a normalizing, disciplining gaze upon them. This is what Foucault basically calls disciplinary power. And uh, um, we'll talk about this in more detail, but in general, so we are talking about, so this starts with prisons, but Bentham says, wouldn't it be nice to have this system everywhere, in schools and hospitals and military barracks and even just in the street, so that people constantly behave according to the rules. And every time people break the rules, they are afraid of punishment, right? And uh, 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 the point of hiding the guard behind this, you know, one-way mirror, if you want, um, is to make the punishment so much more effective, so much more efficient. Because as a matter of fact, it's, it, it's far too costly to place a policeman over everybody's shoulder, right? But when people constantly feel this gaze, even if nobody's looking, but people feel the gaze, people will begin to discipline themselves. So you, you can hear certain sinister connotations of, you know, Christian notions of sin and guilt. 
feeling the gaze of God upon you, so that the, the individual, uh, um, you know, Nietzsche calls the slave morality, right? That, so that the individual disciplines themselves, right? And so we are talking about hierarchical observation. So the prisoners or the school children are observed by the guards in prison or by teachers in, in school, right? And then these uh, low-level observers, like the guards or the teachers, they're also observed. The guards, let's say, are observed by the officers, the teachers are observed by principals, right? And this observation this exists in levels such that, and of course, you can imagine that uh, 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 the people who occupy upper levels of this hierarchy, like the uh, directors of prisons, or maybe ministers or presidents, they are also observed. By whom? By everyone. We live in a society of this transparency and observation. So everybody observes everybody, everybody disciplines everybody. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, this is a structural analysis. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a structural analysis. Power is anonymous. So we, we have this hierarchical observation. We have this normalizing judgment. Constantly, judgments are passed on you. Are you behaving well or poorly? Have you done something good or have you done something bad? And uh, also, again, this notion of examination, that at set periods of time, uh, maybe children have to write an examination or, 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 or inmates have their cases reviewed, right? So there's a formal procedure for examination. And all of these systems, they're all deeply value-laden and judgmental. People are judged constantly on their behavior and there's feedback given in terms of maybe micro-rewards, but so much more importantly in terms of micro-penalties, micro-penalties. So it's like, uh, um, and you can think of, goes back to Hobbes and to Mill, uh, this notion that motivating human behavior through reward is kind of hard because, you know, who knows what you want? Um, can I do something necessarily to please you? But fear is, uh, uh, um, is so much more powerful as a motivator because we're all afraid and we're all afraid of the same things. We're afraid of uh, disapproval. We're afraid of uh, physical punishment. We're afraid of, you know, monetary um, fines or imprisonment or at the end of death penalty, right? So, so, you know, using fear as a constant motivator every step of the way. And this doesn't have to be like grand, the grand fear of, you know, your body being destroyed, right? But it could be like a small fear, again, of a micro penalty of a disapproving gaze. But if, if this is, if this is um, exercised constantly, then the system becomes in enormously efficient. And so what we get, and this is another very important concept, from Foucault, so the way that, that bodies become docile, it's a wonderful metaphor, Foucault talks about the soul as the prison of the body. Soul is the prison of the body. So by the, the punishment striking the soul rather than the body teaches the individual, subjectifies the individual, right? Teaches the individual to discipline themselves themselves, to constantly observe themselves, to constantly correct their behavior. And again, within this whole schema, you can see it's very important. Again, this is not a conspiracy theory. Power is anonymous. It is structural. And it's as if, you know, this grand uh, factory of society that produces individuals with certain kinds of dispositions. Again, a very, uh, a, a very bleak, a very pessimistic picture that we find in Foucault. So Foucault called himself a historian of systems of thought, right? And he attempted to write the history of the present, right? And in the history of the present, crucial question in which Foucault was interested is how does the contemporary mode of subjectification emerge, right? Human beings are not individuals by nature, but human beings become individuals um, within a certain, you know, if you want, cultural formation. So old Hegelian insight that it's not men who make history, but history makes men. And specifically, how do we become individuals that we are? And again, it's very interesting. Before we, before we uh, talk about the details of Foucault's analysis, um, I think it's important to um, tune ourselves, right? to, to, to learn to see something strange in the everyday, to <laughs> learn to question what we take for granted. So on the one hand, we think of ourselves as free individuals, but on the other, if you actually look at social interactions, we are so extremely predictable. Modern human life, by and large, is extremely regular. Right? It's like uh, um, if you live in a large city, 
maybe you uh, travel using a, like a rapid transit system, like you, dr you drive on the road, or maybe uh, uh, you take a metro or the train, everything runs smoothly, everything runs on time. You know, sometimes it doesn't, but by and large it does. And let's say within the metro car, everybody is standing silently, minding their business, right? Uh, uh, and you know, you, you talk to individuals, it's as if you're pressing buttons on robots. We are so extremely predictable. You know, so much of human life, of our contemporary life, so much of the way capitalism works relies on human predictability. Again, this question of this notion of docile bodies, right? So you, the, the foreman in the factory gives a task to the worker and capitalism relies on the fact that the worker will carry out the task. So, so scientific management, right? Uh, goes back to, you know, uh, uh, Taylor and Ford, right? Anyway, so, so how, how have we come here? We lie to ourselves that we are free individuals, but in fact, for the most part, we act as if we are robots. So Foucault uh, um, talks about this transition. So this is a historical progression from sovereign power, broadly speaking in the Middle Ages, disciplinary power in early modern Europe, and uh, the emergence of biopower and governmentality roughly speaking uh, today, although I, I think this process begins maybe in the 19th uh, uh, century. So the sovereign power, uh, Hobbes comes to mind obviously as the power of the king. So um, the, this power is largely absent. It's very costly and it's also largely absent. The application of sovereign power is intermittent. So it is, all, it, it is only very rarely that a particular criminal gets caught, goes on trial, gets punished, and punishment is this gruesome, violent, bloody spectacle. The, the individual is publicly tortured, publicly executed, hacked to pieces, and their ashes thrown to the winds. Foucault gives wonderful descriptions. So interesting, he talks about how the uh, people who are medieval forms of torture, right, executed publicly, are cry, as the, you know, in the way that the damned are supposed to cry in hell. So the punishment is very rarely applied. It is not systematically applied. It's just, it is only intermittent, right? But it is spectacular. But the problem is that, the, you know, it's this punishment is unreliable. And also within this spectacle, it is not clear whom the crowd will sympathize with. I mean, in general, the idea is like, you can imagine that because the punishment is so unreliable, when, punishment actually occurs, it has to be spectacular, right? So the, the lack of constancy of punishment is compensated by the harshness of punishment. But actually, Foucault says that sometimes, probably not, not too often, but sometimes, uh, this can be, you know, the, the act of punishment can be regarded as hostility. It is the body of the condemned that is center stage. And uh, um, sometimes, you know, public spectacles of execution turn, their historical precedents, turn into riots where the let's say the peasants or the townspeople begin to riot in solidarity with the condemned against the king. The punishment is perceived as a hostility, private vengeance of the king against this particular criminal, whereas the people sympathize with the criminal. So the sovereign power is very inefficient. It is very inefficient. And Foucault says, we transition to different forms of punishment, presumably much more humane. But are they humane? Are these modes humane or are they more efficient? So Foucault actually begins his book, Discipline and Punish, by uh, 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 talking about a uh, spectacle of the scaffold and a timetable, the timetable of a prison, right? How there's this change from the spectacular, but also spectacularly wasteful, spectacularly inefficient medieval modes of punishment and a timetable of a prison which is supposed to habituate the criminals, not hack them to pieces, but make them docile, make them again, or, or for the first time, make them productive members of society. So let's, let's, let's focus on these two um, stages. So kind of this is the early modernity and this is later modernity. So in early modernity, again, we talked about this with Bentham, with, with Jeremy Bentham, the invention of the idea of the panopticon. We start with isolated institutions. Uh, prisons, schools, hospitals, uh, you know, especially quarantines, leprosoria, quarantines for the leprous or quarantines for, uh, um, you know, in terms of plagues, right? And in these isolated institutions, disciplinary power, the punishment, the disciplinary punishment is applied to, is applied to dangerous elements. 
let's say, criminals, or mentally sick, or physically ill and contagious, or maybe, uh, let's say, um, if we're talking about schools, uh, unruly children who, you know, cannot, cannot sit still and, and, and uh, obey orders. Um, very interesting question. This is an educational setting, right? To what extent today, in the 21st century, is our education, to what extent is it about development of rich and varied abilities of the children? And to what extent schools today in the 21st century are just about discipline, indoctrination maybe, but even much more importantly about just discipline, just teaching the children, habituating the children to sit and listen, pay attention and carry out orders. Maybe also in ideological indoctrination, but also teaching children to be docile, right? And within this, again, these isolated institutions, these dangerous elements or potentially dangerous elements are treated, treated as individuals. But then the notion that this logic gets transformed, there's a transformation. Um, and uh, um, Foucault talks about this, and we should be reminded of Hegel. Hegel talks about this, the science of the polis, the root of the word police, the science of the city, Politeiswissenschaft, right? How do we organize the whole society like this? So we have this think disciplinary thinking, and then it bleeds over, it spills over into society at large. So we don't just apply the logic of the panoptic and the logic of micro rewards and micro penalties, micro penalties and disciplines in isolated institutions, but in society at large. Not just talking about dangerous elements, but now we talk about increasing utility and productivity of everybody, right? Not just uh, uh, trying to reform criminals, but trying to make everybody more useful, trying to make everybody more productive. And Foucault talks about uh, um, the invention of uh, statistics and the problem of, again, this power knowledge. But anyway, talking about statistical norms, statistical distributions, which are descriptive, but also prescriptive at the same time. That this is very common in universities today, how students know what their place is in the ranking, in the rating, right? In terms of grades, right? So that it's not just about dangerous elements, you know, students who misbehave or are danger of being expelled. No, 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 no. Everybody can improve. If you are not at the top of your class, you can clearly do something to improve yourself. Again, this value judgment in, uh, in, um, implied in this, again, this idea of efficiency for the sake of efficiency, right? So not just dangerous elements, but everybody can always be slightly more productive. And so, again, it used to be applied to these dangerous, isolated individuals and isolated institutions, but now we have this thinking in terms of the population, population as a whole. Population, again, governmentality is a portmanteau of government and mentality, governmental mentality, where we think in terms of the populations, and we think of population as a resource, so you imagine a forest, you need to take care of the forest to protect it from pests, to make sure that you don't cut it um, too fast, you make sure to replant the trees. In a similar fashion, your population needs to be vaccinated. Your population needs to be taught to read and write, to count, right? Uh, um, uh, your population, again, kind of procedures, right? So uh, uh, how children taught to be docile, etc., etc., right? So thinking in terms of individuals, now thinking in terms of populations. And again, um, sinister and bleak and pessimistic because it applies this, you know, factory logic to, this, to the entire system as a whole. And we can see a certain echo of what Marx was talking about in terms of alienation, how human beings become appendages of the machines. And the goal of the system is efficiency, for the sake of efficiency. And uh, uh, um, you could say, well, but why do we care about efficiency? And again, it's, it's structural logic, it's not a conspiracy. Um, in some sense, the, the structure of the system forces se selection pressure akin to the quasi-Darwinian natural selection, forces the drive towards greater, gr greater and greater efficiency. Think about how Marx talks about how capitalism outcompetes feudalism and drives it to extinction. Or a more concrete example that Foucault gives is how during the Franco-Prussian War, Prussia, Prussian army defeats the German, uh, sorry, Prussian army defeats the French army. And so immediately all the countries of Europe have to modernize. So it's fear, fear between the new innovative technology of the Prussian army, the efficiency of the Prussian army forces everybody to play catch up. Not because this is a conspiracy, but because there's this structural logic of competition. 
competition and which which applies particular selection pressures selection not towards a more humane or a freer society but uh, a selection pressure in terms of again efficiency for the sake of efficiency so there is a certain bleak inevitability uh, uh, in Foucault right um, if, if we focus on this notion of again selection pressure that remember how we mentioned Marx uh, communism is clearly a more efficient society, it drives capitalism to extinction. But for Marx, it's also a more humane society that unchains our creative potential. And Foucault kind of casts a shadow of doubt over that. You have to choose efficiency or humanity, perhaps, maybe. Right? Um, but at the same time, I want to stress, um, Foucault, I think, cl very clearly realizes it's more of an ideal type, an idealized model, because in, in reality, in actuality, any kind of deployment of power is never perfect. Any kind of system, disciplinary system like this, is never completely perfect. You know, guards can be corrupt, they can fall asleep, people can get away with all sorts of things, right? So, so uh, you know, whenever power is exercised, Foucault says, there's always a possibility of resistance or, or subversion. So there's also an element of optimism uh, uh, um, there. But at the end of the day, and I want to say again, Foucault is a careful reader of Marx, of Nietzsche, but also of Martin Heidegger. And in Marx and Nietzsche and Heidegger, but also in Max Weber, in Sigmund Freud, and in Herbert Marcuse, and in so many others, uh, there is this similar criticism of modernity. There is a similar problem. So what these philosophers see, let's say Heidegger talks about this technological understanding of being, that you know within the capitalist system, there's this drive uh, uh, towards efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Again, Heidegger writes about this uh, um, you know, during the Cold War, and you can look at uh, the Western capitalist system, you can look at the uh, Soviet so-called socialist system, state socialist system, I guess. You can also think of uh, you know, the, the fascist system, which was defeated in the Second World War. And all of them exemplify this technological understanding and this drive of efficiency, dehumanizing drive um, uh, um, uh, efficiency for the sake of efficiency. Again, and Marcuse quite explicitly calls this performance principle, performance principle, that again, uh, borrowing a notion from Freud, that the dominant principle of the unconscious mind, that every, you know, we modern humans, we are dominated by this uh, guilt complex, uh, 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 <laughs> this notion of, you know, can we be more productive? Can we be more effective? And if you are not as productive as you could be, you are supposed to feel ashamed, guilty, depressed, right? It's kind of, uh, and you know, this dehumanizes us, makes us unhappy, but also at the same time, makes society much more efficient. It's kind of, uh, you know, a problem inherent um, in this entire analysis. And notice how for Foucault, again, the, the question of knowledge, the question of individual self-understanding has these very important political connotations in this politicization of the everyday. The way that we're brought up in schools has important, deeply important political implications. And also notice how uh, politics has traditionally conceived like who, who wins in the next elections, so much less important from a Foucauldian standpoint. The real transformations, the real political battles happen, again, in the everyday, in the school, in the factory, in the shop floor. It's important to realize, again, the way that families are organized, the way that, you know, human sexual life is organized, the way our productive economic life organized, relationships between, you know, foreman and uh, the worker in the factory. These are all deeply political. And um, um, I'll, we'll talk about this more, again, um, about the um, political aspects of epistemology, political aspects of the theory of knowledge, and there are so many ways in which power is connected to knowledge. But let me just recap something I mentioned when we talked about biopower. Again, this notion of uh, uh, the deployment of statistics and the idea of the statistical norm, which, again, uh, uh, um, situates the individual within the homogenous group, right? But, and st uh, statistics, which is, which is at the same time descriptive and prescriptive, right? So, so it's, it, it, allows um, the statistician to categorize large body of data and say, you are, you know, in terms of your, let's say, IQ score, you are at, a, at, the, at this particular point within the general, di within the general statistical distribution. And this desc describes the distribution as a whole. This individuates and describes your place in the distribution, but also judgmentally and prescriptively, you know, silently, or actually maybe sometimes explicitly, tells you, you could be better, you could be better. You are, let's say, below average or below, te uh, below 10% or below 1%, right? So again, it's a kind of interesting performance principle implicit within the way we uh, um, categorize and classify ourselves. And this is just one of those ways 
in which Foucault, again, as a historian of systems of thought, talks about how power produces knowledge about individuals. You deploy power in order to describe individuals, to force the individuals to disclose the truth about themselves, but also how knowing, you know, having knowledge allows to deploy power more efficiently. Again, this uh, 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 mutually reinforcing feedback cycle. So to try to recap, what I think is most important about Foucault's analysis is uh, um, a topic which is very similar to what we have seen in Marx, right? This conflict between the promise of the French Revolution and the reality of the Industrial Revolution, right? So what we have fo formally, officially, on the level of ideology, we have formal freedom and formal popular sovereignty. Uh, Foucault talks about how the Enlightenment at least on the level of ideology, makes it possible for the will of all to be the real basis of sovereignty, for the people to rule. But this is only a mere, mere political emancipation. It's only a formal freedom. Because on the flip side, the reverse side of the liberties invented by the Enlightenment, we have the disciplines, which are also invented by the, the Enlightenment. We give people formal freedom or this is, again, remember, structural analysis. This is, power is anonymous for Foucault, structural and anonymous. People are given real freedom because the submission of bodies is guaranteed. To really oversimplify, you could say, you give people the vote because you know how they will, will vote, right? And uh, the flip side of popular sovereignty is the disciplinary power. Again, people are formally sovereign, but people are constituted by the social structure, especially what, by what Foucault calls the, the discourse or, or the episteme, but you could say disciplinary power, right? Constituted in a particular fashion. It's kind of, this is, this is actually a very important notion, right? That for Foucault, in many ways, we don't, we don't see one individual, individual A, controlling another individual, individual B. No, in fact, what happens is that over and above, there's this, you know, social uh, disciplinary structure. There's this disciplinary structure which produces the individual A such that the individual A gives a certain predictable command and the individual B is also produced by a similar structure to carry out this command. So power in an important sense is not possessed by the individual A, but it is exercised through the individual A. So again, like to make this much more concrete, uh, the classroom very much for Foucault is a situation of power. But am I speaking? Do I have the power in the classroom? In an important sense, uh, uh, power, I do not possess power, I exercise power. Power flows through me. In an important sense, I do not speak the language, the language speaks through me. I talk about the things that I have, writ uh, that I have read in books, that I have been taught by teachers, right? And the, the, the syllabus according to which I teach has been supervised, there's a system of surveillance, it has been approved, right? And even these videos have to be approved before they are posted, right? So in an important sense, uh, uh, I am allowed to exercise power because I have gone through the hoops of the disciplinary apparatus. And of course, the system is not perfect, but by and large, this is, this is what Foucault is trying to capture. Again, this, this uh, uh, anonymity and, and structural nature um, um, of power. But, but again, so in some sense, we're going back to Marx but with a much more pessimistic cast of mind. Marx imagines, especially young romantic Marx, imagines that it is so simple to cast off the, uh, the shackles of uh, capitalist society and achieve freedom in communism. But uh, uh, Foucault asks these deep questions. How is child rearing going to be organized in communism? How, is, how are schools going to be organized in communism? Again, think back to Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci talks about communism, calls it a well-ordered society. Ordered society, right? But what is the order going to be like, right? So it's kind of politicization of the everyday. So pushing political questions deeper into the cultural fabric of reality. It is less important whom people elect. It is much more important how people are constituted to vote in the elections before they even vote. I guess another way uh, uh, to look at this entire issue is that we have this ancient ideal, right? That in society, 
imagine as a triangle, there's a hierarchy of talent. There's this meritocratic hierarchy of talent. There's a, you know, supremely uh, capable individuals, and in a well-ordered society, these supremely capable individuals occupy positions of power, right? But there's a correspondence of talent to power, this ideal of meritocracy, right? But Foucault is going to say, no, it is actually, in reality, it is the other way around. There are certain demands of the power structure. There's the demand of submission of forces. So the line doesn't go in this direction. The line goes in the other direction. The hierarchy of power demands that people are produced with particular talents. So, for example, we need, let's say, menial laborers who can be exploited. And so the social structure needs to produce menial laborers, right? So the question is, like, nobody is a janitor by nature. Nobody is a mailman by nature. But the social system demands that there are mailmen and janitors. And so the, you know, the social system will produce people who will slot, who will dance according to the logic of the division of labor, if you want. Um, and immediately, like, two things I want to focus on within this analysis. First is this idea of individuation. Individuation, again, nobody is a janitor or a mailman by nature. But it is, again, the capitalist system that will produce people as janitors or mailmen or as CEOs or as teachers or whatever, right? But it is the social system that produces people, mass produces people as if in a factory. Um, um, but also, of course, there's a question of class. And in Marx, this was very explicit, that you have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And I want to say that to some extent, even though Foucault does not really thematize it all that much, um, I think mostly for rhetorical reasons, because, because of the uh, com complicated cultural and political realities of what it meant to be a, a Marxist at the time when Foucault was alive. I think very clearly Foucault is deeply influenced by Marx, and he is a kind of a Marxist, but he doesn't call himself a Marxist. Basically, for political reasons, this is my own, my own reading. So the class analysis is there in, in Foucault. Foucault understands that the deployment of disciplines uh, very much is tied to the rise of the bourgeoisie. He, he understands this. But at the same time, his analysis is de goes deeper and is more radical than Marx's analysis. And I think Foucault can, can imagine how, how you could have a properly socialist system in which you do not, you, you, maybe even you have a classless society, but still you have this deeper level of oppression, deeper level of oppression. And another huge topic, there's no time to go into this, but I want to uh, just mention it as an asterisk. So when we talk about individuation, so we spoke about uh, disciplinary power, we spoke about biopower, but there's also a kind of governmentality, a kind of biopower, which Foucault associates with neoliberalism, uh, and especially with this ideas of uh, um, uh, homo economicus, homo economicus. Um, again, describing individuals in a certain way and governing individuals in a certain way. Uh, in some sense, again, internalizing the power structures even more. The characteristic of neoliberalism is that, again, like the, the, the old industrial mode of production was that the factory worker was like a machine, and the factory worker was supposed to learn the motions by heart. And now neoliberalism wants to, wants to, to, to tap into uh, creative potential of individuals even more, to exploit the individuals even more, even deeper, right? So that uh, the individuals kind of learn to discipline themselves, like to, to harness the creative potential, like provide the individuals with a system of rewards and punishments. So, because again, at the end of the day, uh, teaching a human to be like a machine might be less efficient than giving them a task and then allowing them to fulfill this task, you know, like at their own pace. You can think of, you know, people who are maybe employed at home, right, like um, freelance work, uh, which may be to some extent, seemingly more free, like you are free from the coercive schedule, like nobody's clocking when you come to work. But the structure of incentives is such that actually, as a matter of fact, even though you're working from home, you will wake up at ungodly hours and you will like, you know, your conscience and like the, the objective necessity will, will, will force you <laughs> uh, uh, to exploit yourself even more. So it's a huge topic. I don't want to go into this, but again, this notion of neoliberalism as actually an even more efficient way to exploit individuals, and actually, actually, to some extent, an even more inhumane way. Like um, under capitalism, there's separation between home and work, and in this post-industrial late capitalism, even home uh, uh, begins, like appears as as part of work. Home uh, um, 
functions as, as, as part of work. And now you, you don't just have to be productive at home, but you have to be productive in the way you sleep and in the way you organize your leisure time. Like <laughs> a, way, a way of the economic system to get into the individual's head even deeper. So, another important topic which we've already touched upon is this mutual relationship between power and knowledge. Power allows the extraction of knowledge about individuals, production of knowledge about individuals, and having knowledge about individuals then allows for a more efficient deployment of power over them. Right? This is, in an important sense, it's a surface level. We can go one level deeper. Right? So there's a certain notion which kind of goes back to David Hume and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and maybe Montesquieu, can this, maybe even to Plato, can this idea that uh, um, human beings, right, we don't just exist naturally in the world, we also describe our existence in certain judgmental terms, in terms of language. Again, we are linguistic beings, Sprachlichkeit, we have linguisticality. And language is judgmental, right? So there's a certain discourse, there's a certain... Uh, mode of understanding of reality. And this mode of understanding of reality has political relevance. So Foucault talks about discourse or sometimes discursive formation. He uses the Greek word episteme. Uh, and these words function in a similar fashion to what uh, uh, Marx calls ide an ideology, ideology, right? And an ideology is a structural systematic misrepresentation of reality. Well, I say misrepresentation, but in, in an important sense, it's not clear if we can ever go beyond this misrepresentation to see reality as it really is, right? So, like, uh, um, you know, you can go from one ideology to another ideology for Foucault. You can go from one discourse to another discourse, but you cannot stand outside the discourse and see things as they are in themselves, you know, think back to our lecture on Kant. Right? But in an important sense, right, I talk about how power flows through me, how language speaks through me. There's a discursive formation, like a, a culture, if you want. Cannot men make history, but history makes men. A discursive formation, discourse, which produces individuals such that one of them understands themselves as a policeman, another one, let's say, understands themselves as a criminal. And therefore, the policeman exercises the power over the criminal, but ultimately the notion is that, again, there's a dis the power is anonymous, and it doesn't really belong to the policeman, but the policeman exercises this power, it flows through the policeman to the criminal. And this has important political implications, because, again, if we want to change society, we want to change the discourse. This is why. May 1968 in France, politicization of the everyday. It's another important uh, uh, philosopher whom we keep mentioning, and maybe we'll uh, discuss a bit more in the next lecture, whose name is Antonio Gramsci. Uh, 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 and Antonio Gramsci explicitly calls this, well, Gramsci is writing before Foucault, but uh, uh, I want to uh, push an analogy to Gramsci's notion of the war of position. War of position. And Gramsci talks about how within the intellectual sphere, what he calls the organic intellectuals, can gradually, step by step, wage this war of position against the ideological hegemony. He talks about, of course, the proletarian intellectuals waging the uh, war of position against the capitalist hegemony, trying to restructure, reframe the way people see the world, the way people understand themselves and the reality around them. When we discussed Kant, we, we talked about the categories of perception, categories of perception that are, you know, uh, categories which are due to our, our nature, maybe let's say biological nature. But we have also mentioned how, you know, Kant seeks to find the necessary and inevitable categories of perception, like he imagines how space and time are somehow intrinsic, uh, uh, um, like necessary for all rational creatures of the universe, maybe. Um, modern science would tend to disagree, but I, I was talking about how philosophy after Kant seeks to find what is actually contingent, right? And especially what is culturally relevant, right? Uh, and Hegel talks about this a lot, how within different cultures we see the same action as, you know, as, as different, right? So imagine seeing somebody, seeing a particular individual in the Middle Ages as a witch or maybe as a saint, and by and large, we don't see people as witches or saints anymore. Or let's say, see somebody as a serf, or as a lord, or as a king with the divine rights. Uh -huh. So this is kind of 
knowledge, the knowledge structure, which has political implications. But similarly, we can talk about how today we see certain people as criminals. We see certain people as policemen. We see certain people as mad or insane. Or we see certain people as teachers or uh, wise Nobel Prize winners. And this gives them power, right? So seeing individuals gives them power. But Foucault would say in an important sense, nobody is criminal, policeman, madman, or teacher by nature. It is our present discursive formation, which um, in some sense shows people, displays people as, as criminals. And, and uh, uh, Foucault, of course, in his genealogical fashion, urges us to look for the potential to, you know, to, to see things differently. Maybe, maybe, you know, implicit in Foucault, the same way that we don't think that witches exist anymore. Maybe, you know, in the transformation, historical transformation, we will stop attributing uh, uh, criminality to people, right? So it's like uh, change, change the way we see the world. Again, this politicization of the everyday. Um, and in general, again, um, post-structuralism or post-modernism, uh, which are very careless labels, probably best not to use them, but certainly Foucault has been asso associated with these labels, right? Within this whole movement, there's this deep attentiveness to language, especially when you see something, a particular practice, like the bourgeois nuclear family, or let's say enlightenment progressiveness or capitalism, seeing something as inevitable, natural, or progressive, right, is, is value-laden. In an important sense, Foucault uh, um, asks us, invites us, uh, hermeneutics of suspicion, to suspect, like, in, in, in whose interest in this, in whose interest in this description, or maybe like even, because uh, in whose interest that's an agent, right? But power ultimately for Foucault is structural, right? right? What kind of structure of power, what kind of discursive formation uh, um, leads to the rise of this mode of seeing reality? Again, um, a deeply mm, critical element of Foucault's analysis. And this is why um, I want to say that when we talk about Foucault's positive project, because there's a lot of criti criticism in Foucault, but where do we go from this? Um, again, Foucault's own politics were fairly left-wing, maybe to some extent liberal, to some extent progressive. You know, it's like uh, uh, um, he was worried, he cared deeply and actually engaged in struggles for the rights of uh, um, inmates, of prisoners, uh, for the rights of minorities in France, or um, let's say, the rights of immigrants, right? So he cared about, you know, broadly speaking, left-wing agenda. But, but on the other hand, he was not, uh, he didn't call himself, let's say, a Marxist or a communist. And I think it's, it's very important to understand why. Because for Foucault, there's always a danger. Like, when you, you know, put on a white robe and say, I am a, you know, Marxist, I am fighting for progress of humanity. This is always somewhat suspect, right? So I think that Foucault, in general, you know, like the, 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 the rationale, the motivation behind his whole project is uh, 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 deeply progressive. Like he's fighting for his own liberation and for the liberation of his fellow human beings. He's trying to find ways to resist the, the structures of power. But at the same time, he's very cautious. He's very wary of dressing this fight in some sort of grand ideology. Like, uh, uh, you know, like the ideology of communism, for example. Because again, there's always this problem of how uh, um, a, an ideology of liberation can be subverted and can simply become a different form of determination. So let's talk uh, uh, in more detail about a very important aspect of Foucault's story, and this is his positive project. Again, Foucault, for most of his life, um, as, as a philosopher, as an academic, and his theoretical work was very careful to not take positions. Now, in his uh, um, private or uh, political life, right, he, he was actually deeply engaged. But as a theoretician, he was always very careful to distance himself from any kind of uh, uh, um, projects of liberation or social movements, again, intellectually speaking, even though as a matter of political practice, he took part in so many projects like this. Um, so let's let's try to understand this a bit more, and um, I want to talk about what I think ultimately is a very interesting productive dialogue between uh, Foucault and Marxism, first and foremost. Uh, I mentioned that I don't think that Foucault was a Marxist in a straightforward fashion, right? but there's a certain interesting um, point of connection between the two. Uh, let's start from afar. Let's start from this again. We talk about this notion how 
An individual, this is the death of the subject. The individual is a product of larger forces, right? And so uh, we have beliefs, values, and desires, but our beliefs, values, and desires within this anti-humanist, post-humanist mechanistic picture, beliefs, values, and desires are in some sense, ways to control human behavior, individual behavior, ways to code for human behavior. Again, beliefs, values, desires. If, if I can make you believe something that is a way to control your behavior, if I can make you value something, if I can Im implant a certain value into your head, think of something as noble, or ignoble, that's a way to control your behavior. And again, notice this Sprachlichkeit, linguisticality, this doubling of existence. People can enjoy something and yet describe their pleasure as sinful. Hmm? So beliefs, and likewise, if you desire something, if you want something, or, or if you are averse to something, this could be used against you. Again, this notion of the use of pleasure or use of displeasure. The fact that uh, if human beings are physically assaulted, they experience pain, right? This threat of pain or of death can be used, can be deployed politically in order to control human behavior, right? And in, in an important sense, um, I was, let me, let me digress a little bit. Um, I was thinking, I was actually listening to a course on uh, uh, the history of China and uh, um, some long story about the 5,000 years of Chinese history. And at some point um, it was mentioned that particular provinces started to specialize on, on growing tea and silk. And sort of within this broad scope of the course, um, it was kind of clear that, you know, the, the, the politics of China revolved around being able to deploy forces, right? Especially uh, being able to um, mobilize agriculture and mobilize the army. And in many ways, these two are related. So you can grow rice to feed the troops. And also like the, the, the peasants, they grow rice, but also the peasants are the source for the conscripted army. Right? And so it's very clear why China needs rice. But why does China need tea and silk? Why does China need tea and silk? Right? And so it occurred to me, that again, in terms of this use of pleasure, tea and silk are things that human beings desire. It is a way to, <laughs> I don't know, to get inside of human beings' head and to motivate them to be more efficient. But a worker, if you dangle, the, the, the carrot of, you know, offer them opportunity to buy tea and silk, they will become more productive. Or let's say the manager or, or the, the owner of a factory because they want, uh, uh, you know, luxurious clothing or something like that, they will be driven to exploit the workers at a higher rate of exploitation, right? And you can think of uh, tea and silk as like lighter, more benign versions of basically drugs like opium, right? So if you could inject opium into people's heads and, and like just make them uh, addicted and force them to work for drugs, this might in principle uh, allow you a tighter control. However, opium just destroys their body bodies just too fast. So in this sense, like opium is too potent of a drug, but tea and silk are benign enough, right? And this is kind of a totally different way of looking uh, um, at the history of humanity. Again, when you stop seeing individuals and you stop seeing individual actions and you only see like forces, the blind, again, this abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, in the words of Immanuel Kant, it's a blind deterministic causation, right? Blind forces struggling one against another. One social system fighting against another social system, you know, Who's going to be more efficient? Which, which system is going to be more efficient? Which system is going to be able to outcompete? So Marx uh, 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 talks about commodity fetishism. So it's a complicated phrase in Marx, which is uh, uh, very often misunderstood. But this is uh, basically what Marx means by commodity fetishism. Is that he says what actually gets exchanged in the market is not one good for another good. To think that market is about exchange of commodities is to fetishize the commodity. Commodity, you know, exchange of commodities actually is just a node, is just a way of exchanging labor power for labor power. Like to, over, to oversimplify, when you walk into a store and you buy a good with bits of money, you're not exchanging one object to another object. To think that is to fetishize the commodity, right? What actually gets exchanged are units of congealed labor units of congealed coerced labor. Sometimes Marx talks about wage slavery. So like abstract hours of slave labor exchanged for abstract hours of you know, wage slave labor. 
It's kind of a totally different way of looking at the system, right? And so in this sense, again, if you, if you like something, if you want something, this could be used against you. This could be used to control you. It's kind of a very bleak and sinister way of looking at the world. And so within this entire logic, obviously the next step is to ask, okay, but you know, it, within this structure of domination, uh, uh, you know, even if it's not perfect, um, you know, sometimes people can be corrupt, sometimes the exercise of power is not perfect, it's not absolute, but you know, what, what um, um, role is there for any kind of freedom? What are the real interests of the individuals? What are the real interests? And uh, Stephen Lukes, uh, another uh, Marxist philosopher, asked this question very directly, you know, in, in the wake of ideological misinterpretation, how do we distinguish between real interests and simply like ideologically induced interests? This is a very serious and not a very, you know, it's a question to which uh, the answer is not particularly clear. Where is this Archimedean standpoint? How do I know what I actually should do and what is just, you know, the social system trying to con take control of my behavior through shaping my beliefs, values, and desires? 